Greetings, I'm Shad, and it is time to clear up the confusion that surrounds the sword known as the rapier. To kick us off, the word rapier, in its original sense when it was first used, didn't always refer to the sword that many people think it currently refers to or identifies. The word rapier often was used to, to identify, yes, the sword you think of, but also the sword that we currently understand as the side sword. Does that mean that the word rapier is incorrect? Well, no, because the word was used to refer to the sword that we think of, the long, narrow, thrust-centric sword, and so it's not actually referring to anything incorrect. Now, we could ask, does that mean the term side sword is incorrect? Yes, it kind of does. I mean, side sword is not necessarily a historically accurate term, but the reason why side sword has evolved is that when we look at a side sword and a rapier, we see very two different kinds of swords. And though some of the techniques that are used in both of these styles of swords can be, you know, used on the other type, one is clearly more focused and specialised in thrusting than the other one. So I agree with the terminology that has evolved to now just being used in the common day, uh, side sword and a rapier. The other interesting thing to note is that there are a couple of sources that say that the word rapier wasn't even used to identify the sword that we think of when we hear rapier during the heyday of when that sword was actually used. It came in a little bit after. Now, how accurate is that little fact? I don't know, it was hard to find. What I can certainly say is that rapier is a historic term and it was used to identify both the sword that we think of, long, narrow, thrust centric, and also the side sword. Now, why have I been saying the sword that you would think of when you hear this word? Uh, now, I say that in reference to people who actually know what a real rapier is. Because for other people who are not as educated in what swords are, when they hear the word rapier, they'll actually hear, and this is where the uh, confusion comes in, they will think of many other different types of swords. They might think of a small sword, or they might think of a foil, the type of weapon, well not really a weapon, the type of tool that's used in modern day sport fencing. In the modern standardised use of the word rapier, those swords are not rapiers at all. This is why I need to be so specific, because back in the day, actually in history, the names of swords were far more loose and flexible. As long as the people around you knew what type of sword you were referring to in whatever name you were using, that's what you could use and it wouldn't be a problem. You could have called swords that we identify as rapiers as dingle hoppers and it would have done the job. People, if they knew what it was referring to, yeah, it's a dingle hopper. And incidentally, I've actually done a whole video on the concept of how swords were named in history. Were swords ever just called swords? And oftentimes they were. But when there was a need to differentiate between one sword to another, that's when more specific word terms came in and are often more descriptive kind of phrases that were used loosely, like long sword, classic example. Long sword has been used to identify many different types of swords. What you need to understand though, in the modern day though, now, we have very specific terms that we now identify to very specific types of swords. And it's very useful and important that we do that to avoid confusion. We need a standardized list. And according to that standardized modern terminology, rapier never refers to a foil or a small sword or you know any other kind of like sword, including side sword. No, in the modern terminology, rapier refers to a very slender, also long for being one-handed, very long, thrust-centric style of sword, and that's the type of sword I'm going to be defining and describing to you. Because even if you understand, you have the right image of the sword in your mind, there are many misconceptions about even that very specific style sword. And the biggest misconception about this sword, okay, look at the pictures, okay, this sword, not this one, not this one, this sword. Biggest misconception about this sword is that people think it's light. You can understand why people think it's light, because with the other swords that the rapier can be misidentified as, like the small sword or the foil, well those are very very light swords, and the foil I wouldn't even call that a sword. It's actually a long thin pointy bit of wire. Well let's clear that up. A proper rapier is not light at all. It weighs equally as much as a normal arming sword. The difference is, is the weight distribution. No weight has actually been taken off, all right? Yes, it has a thinner blade, but the blade is far longer, and there is a full swept hilt as well, which also adds that weight back. So what is that weight? It's about one kilo, okay? There are lighter versions and there are heavier versions, but the average weight, you know, one to 1.2 kilos, that's, that is the average. Exactly equivalent to what the medieval arming sword is. So with that in mind, 
the rapier is not a girly weapon that is easier for women to use. And you see this a lot in fantasy. When a girl needs a sword, she'll pick a rapier. Why? Because it's lighter. Well, actually, no, <laughs> right? The rapier is quite a beasty weapon. As beasty as an arming sword, and it is just as manly as any other sword. Men... They use the rapier a heck of a lot, and that includes big, burly, muscle-bound men. Of course they use the rapier. So then, how is the rapier beastie? Well, for one, a proper rapier isn't nearly as flimsy and flexible as people think. When you see people training with rapiers, well, guess what? They're using a practice rapier. And for, for the purpose of safety, those weapons are you, or they're made, to be far more flexible than what they really were in history. You don't want to run someone through while you're practicing, so they're made to have a lot more give than what a real rapier actually had. A real rapier, they were made to be as rigid, as stiff as possible, so that dangerous, deadly point will go through whoever you stick it into. So these are actually rigid, stiff blades. Now, don't get me wrong, there'll be flex in them, but what I'm saying is that it will take far more force to flex that blade than what you commonly think of. The other beastly thing about the rapier is that the blades were strong, okay? Okay, and you can have a look at different examples and granted some rapiers are a bit thinner than the average and some are a bit thicker but my point is here is that these blades are strong you can't cut through them with another sword and that just oh, ticks me off ticks me off when I see it done okay rapiers cannot be cut through by other swords under huge amounts of stress they can snap like any sword uh, look it's the Mythbusters, all right? But even in this test done by the Mythbusters, the sword isn't cut in two, okay? It actually handles their impact fine, but then the huge amount of warping and bending that happens from that impact, when it whips back, that's when it snaps. So if you think that a katana can cut through a rapier, get that idea out of your head. It is an absolute load of bull. I should really add a caveat here, okay? When I say you can't cut through rapier, and indeed you can't really cut through any sword, that's under normal combat conditions, okay? If you were to brace the sword against something solid, and it was, say, a more poorly made sword, it still was made out of steel, and then you had a really beastly heavy cutter, well then you might be able to get away and cause it to break into you. What will happen, you'll never have a clean cut. You'll penetrate enough that puts so much stress in that localized area that you'll cause it to crack can break completely all the way through. You won't do a clean cut. And indeed, this is what we see in the, it's a beautiful video, by the way, but it's still a fairly rigged test. The advantage is that they test this with both the longsword and the katana. So it's under the same conditions. That's how we can make a comparison in the two. But still, against the actual sword that both the katana and the longsword is striking, it's fairly rigged against that sword. It's set up in the most advantageous ways to try and cause a clean break all the way through. And we see that the longsword achieves that. The katana doesn't. But under normal battle fight conditions, you would never be able to pull that off. Why? Because when a sword is struck, it'll give, dispersing most of the force that's put into it. Another beastly thing about the rapier's blade is just how long it is. It's huge, okay? We're talking around a metre in length and sometimes a metre 20 centimetres in length. Standard one-handed swords, we're looking at arming swords, back swords, side swords, and other things like that. Side swords can be a bit longer, but, you know, the standard, you know, one-handed swords, they generally max out at 80 centimetres in terms of their blade. And that added reach on a rapier is just, it can be devastating. But it is a trade, okay? What you gain in the thrust, you detract in its cutting capacity. Cutting is another thing that is very misunderstood about a rapier. A rapier, if it has an edge, because granted, there are actually some historical rapiers that were made had no edge on them at all. They were just thrusting, stabbing machines. But the ones that did have blade edges, you know, on them, they could be very sharp and they could do some devastating cuts. But you need to understand the context, okay? Think about how long the rapier is. If you have a razor's edge going all the way along it, all right, and then you put it and just draw that blade all the way across someone's neck, my goodness, you're going to open up an artery and cut all the way to the bone easy. What the rapier lacks is stopping power or force behind the cut, and that's the difference. So rapiers can make pretty darn nasty cuts, okay, but they're not going to lop through bone. To get through bone, that's when you need a lot of force. Let's understand this. The rapier is a beastie and deadly sword. It's not a girly sword, it's not a light sword, it's not particularly faster than other swords either. It's in how they use. The rapier does rely on 
fast, quick thrusts, but you can thrust equally as fast with an arming sword because they weigh the same. The difference is, is that the rapier has reach. And dealing with thrust from a weapon of this type of reach, oh my goodness, that is really hard. How then was the rapier used? It has been said that the rapier is very much a specialized dueling sword, and that is correct, okay? So much about its design has been emphasized to help out in the one-on-one -on -one duel, but that can lead to a misconception that it was used more in civilian fights, duels, than on battlefields. That's incorrect. The rapier was used massively on battlefields. Now, was it a primary battlefield weapon? No, it filled the function that swords have so often filled in most of history, and that is as a backup weapon. But as that backup weapon, masses amounts of soldiers used it. And that's the same for civilians, okay? Uh, the rapier, though it was decently popular, it wasn't used by everyone. There was a lot of variants, okay? Back swords, hugely popular as well. And of course, the side sword, again, very popular. And it's funny, that's why people might think the rapier is even more popular because the side sword, when, ra when the word rapier was used, it was often just as much used to refer to what we would call a side sword as was a rapier. So again, that can make it sense as to why we think the rapier was so popular when in fact there was a wide range of swords used during that time. So I hope we all have a better understanding now of what the sword that we most often refer to when we use the word rapier is. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed and until next time, farewell. If you would like to support Shadowversity or express appreciation for a video that you particularly enjoyed, please become a patron through Patreon. Your $1 donation would be absolutely wonderful.